Awesome to welcome G League Ignite General Manager Anthony McClish to the Basketball Podcast. The NBA G League Ignite is the first of its kind team dedicated to developing top young prospects in preparation for the NBA draft. Anthony, welcome to the Basketball Podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Coach. Excited. Well, I'm grateful. I got a chance to spend two days with uh, you and your organization and uh, saw practice, saw the uh, pregame shoot around, I saw the game, and then you and I had a chance to spend a lot of time together as well. And, uh, you know, one thing that stood out, and I want you to talk about this because I'm imagining this is one of your strengths. You asked incredible questions. And I don't find that's always the case when I sit down with people, but you ask questions, not just from a perspective of curiosity, but also from one of devil's advocate, which I really do value that it's like, even if you might agree with something, sometimes you challenged me just simply because that helps dive deeper in terms of the topic. And I want to thank you for that. Yeah, I'm glad you appreciate that because my girlfriend doesn't. So <laughs> I suppose there's a time and a place uh, for that type of questioning and dialogue. I, I am thankful to be able to call R.C. Buford a mentor of mine. I, my first job in professional sports was with the Spurs as an intern, and I'm proud to say that I was an intern and stand by that title. And I remember, among other things that he taught me and exemplified, he said the person who asks the best questions wins. And he was he was consistent in bringing in new information, new sources of information. He encouraged article sharing and and either formal or organic dialogue and debate back and forth. And so as a 22, 23 year old, that was my first experience in professional sports and saw the benefits of that not only for him as a leader, but then also for the group and what that can do for the group. And, you know, what's the phrase like, you know, if you light one candle, take a candle and you light others, it doesn't diminish the candle, what, what, right? Like it's, it was one of those things where you just, you know, it, everyone is, is more intelligent for it and they're more connected. So that was where I first saw the example. And then just over the course of the last few years, uh, I, I think I've, I've grown to try to tend towards being curious and really understanding uh, as, as opposed to someone telling you something and, oh, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense, whether you whether you understand it or not, right? And a lot of times, maybe you don't fully understand a concept uh, that someone's that someone's uh, presenting or a or, uh, conversation that's happening. So I think that's where that comes from. And uh, I appreciate your receptivity to it. That was wonderful. And I think the, the other magic of that is to be able to do it in a way that doesn't come across to the other person as being confrontational. And that I imagine is the art of it as well. And maybe you got that from RC as well, but just talk to us about that because I imagine in your coach GM relationship or your agent GM relationship, player GM relationship, that's got to be a part of the process for you is where you can ask a question without it coming across as being confrontational. I think, uh, and I would love to hear your opinion on this too, uh, I think that's the foundation of, of empathy and sympathy, uh, if you want to take it even a step further uh, from an emotional standpoint. Um, yeah, I think you have to try, um, not even in conflict management, just in, in uh, ideation and uh, innovation and um, self-reflection. I think the more you can understand where someone else is coming from, and what their position is and why they're presenting an idea, whether that be uh, in alignment with a belief that you have already or something that is maybe deviant from that or, or an innovative way of thinking. I really don't know any other way to really develop empathy unless you ask questions. And I think if I think it can go, it can go both ways. One is if you already have trust with that person, it can be fruitful. But I think question asking in a genuine and authentic way also helps build trust. And I think people enjoy, I mean, like the reason I guess that, that I'm here is like people enjoy sharing their stories and sharing information. And so question asking and, and receiving is a way to do that, I think, very effectively. Oh, that's a great answer. And, you know, I would say it's grounded in humility and especially in our roles as either a coach or GM is, is grounded in humility, but also in a common purpose, regardless of ego right? We're all trying to do our best and help the players be the best version of themselves. And, you know, and I felt that authentically, obviously, from you and the organization in terms of that is that you're doing things in the best interest of the players. And, you know, that probably leads us into this next part, which is 
pretty common question, I'm sure, for you, but like balancing the focus on individual player development with the overall success and competitiveness of the team. Yeah, uh, I get that question a lot. The reason that that I love the G League Ignite in particular is because we're very genuinely and consistently focused on development and, as you said, doing right by the player. In other situations, whether that be college or international, NBA, professional, you might have the leader, the head coach, the GM, whoever it is, right? Because now it's, you know, who who runs player development? Is it management or is it coaching? Like that's one of these issues uh, in the NBA. But whomever is leading that, if it is in alignment with other organizational goals or program goals, then you do it. And then if not, generally development tends to take a backseat towards winning, let's say, keeping standing of a contract or keeping political standing or whatever. So Ignite, we don't have that. Thankfully, we don't have that. It's very genuinely aimed at doing right by the player at, at the individual level. And of course, we have to create uniform standards and sets of behaviors because we don't play tennis or golf. We play basketball. And so we have to create some team standards. Uh, But within that, the main focus is how do we get these guys better and how do we help them and how do we put resources around them, examples around them, put them in situations that are the most conducive to their individual development within our team structure. And that is, it's the most fulfilling job that I've had because of the relationship building and all of the personality dynamics in the, in the, that go into that, just a very fulfilling. And I know you appreciate that too. I think that's why we got along so well. I love development and the focus on that. And and it's purest form is what you get to do there. You know, and, and the reason I ask the question is I think there's, there's, I know there's high school coaches and I'm dealing with some college coaches right now that are kind of in a similar example where it's like their younger players are their better players or their future possibilities, but they're trying to balance their development with obviously winning, which sometimes comes from experience. And you have that as well with this blended roster where you bring in some NBA veterans and some successful longtime pros to be able to balance that with the younger players. Talk to us a little bit about that mentorship model. Yeah, it's among other principles or aspects of psychology. That's one that I've become very, very interested in and especially like researching the science behind it, right? The science behind mentorship and examples and putting examples around players. And, you know, you could pull from lessons on like, you know, social conformity experiments and, and things like that, maybe to learn some lessons on how to do it in as optimally a way as possible. But for our young guys, I think it's really important to have examples around them at the peer level, not at the coach level or the management level or even like a strength coach or something, but have those peer examples. And I saw it over the course of my years in the NBA, how how valuable veteran leadership was, how valuable even, you know, and mentorship uh, doesn't even have to be an older player. It can be someone who, you know, is close to an age group and, and, and has a relatability with a young player. But it's it's something that we take very seriously. We vet, huh, pun intended, we vet our veteran players very, very strictly and, and try to be as transparent as possible with them because there are many benefits in a biased, in a biased way. There are many benefits of being with Ignite, but there are also some sacrifices. And it just depends on if you are in a place in your life and have the personality characteristics such that you appreciate those trade-offs and view them as favorable in your way. But we know that whether that be Jarrett Jack with Jalen Green or, you know, now a Norris Cole who has two NBA championships, right? Trying to, is backing up a point guard, Dink Pate, who's, who was 17 years old and was the youngest pro to ever sign a contract in the United States. So we can, we can teach and we can verbalize and we can exemplify as adults but the more impactful teaching and learning you're going to come, especially even in, in the locker room at the back of the bus, like those organic moments when they take the guys out to eat, those are really impactful. And so we have to really put the right veterans around the guys to allow for those situations to happen. We also got along because you love diving into the science and that's part of it, I know. So feel free to share some of it, but also like you mentioned the organic moments. I think we can all relate to that, but talk to us a little about some of those other moments, maybe some moments that are less organic that you're trying to create these situations where they can actually mentor. And as you said, be relatable to some of the younger players. 
Yeah, there are many of those. And and that could either happen, I mean, maybe most tangibly, like for coaches who are listening with lineup combinations, right? We talk about that quite a bit as a staff of who are the five-man lineup combinations. There are times where we've put five draft eligible players out there for stretches and we'll see how they do. And it's an opportunity for growth, but also our kind of internal evaluation to see how they're doing and how they play next to each other. But there are many moments where we very specifically put different veterans in with different young players and to try to mitigate and enhance, mitigate risk and enhance the strengths of the young guys. So that's a very clear, tangible one, I think, that probably coaches can relate to. Also, whether that be like positional skill work breakdowns, having a voice in practice, the veterans know and are empowered with a voice in practice to where at any given moment, they are able to share stories, whether that be from a, a fundamental teaching standpoint or, or an experiential standpoint, or, you know, a lot of our guys, a lot of our veteran players will share stories about being drafted, being traded, having to learn to play with other, other great players, having to learn another coach's system. So we, we put, and, and now we get into the, to the point of the season where it's more appropriate to really get into the scouting process and the evaluation process to share what, is going to happen in our young men's lives from like the combine through the draft. And so obviously someone like John Jenkins, who's been a first round pick and he has an Olympic gold medal and he's been with multiple teams. He can share stories that are firsthand first person. And he's already built those relationships with the players. Like we talked about in the locker room, but he can share these stories of say of like, Hey, yeah, you know, this is what you guys are going to go, go through. And I think that really helps our young players. I know that helps our young players. Absolutely does. And, uh, you know, you mentioned again, team building in this process and talking about kind of having some older players, some younger players and that balance. But I'm curious, particularly from the younger players perspective, are you just trying to get the best players you can get, say, you know, if they're the top 10 ranked players, you're trying to get them and then figure it out after the fact, or is there a lot going into kind of construction of team and team building in advance? Yeah, I, it's, it's similar to how I think any professional team should run their uh, team building processes. And that is you find the fit. <laughs> you, have to, you have to really define fit and what that is. This program is not for everybody. We tell people that all the time. Uh, it's for a select few that have a, a values alignment and a goals alignment and a uh, background and a personal characteristics alignment with us. And of that subset of, of players, some will want to go overseas and some will want to go to college. And those are, I mean, I went to college. I went to college twice. <laughs> it's just uh, went back and got a master's degree. So we're not anti-college, but what we offer is unique and differentiated and we present that. And if it resonates, then we'll have some conversation. There, there are many talented evaluators out there at the grassroots level that establish rankings and and give notes uh, to high school athletes so of course we have good relationships with them and, and they have information that's valuable for us to know at the same time we necessarily have our own set of criteria that we that, that we use to to identify and select the players and a lot of that is going to be at a professional lens and through a professional lens. You know, in my in my seven years with the Kings, uh, you know, I was in the war room and ran combine interviews and ran the pre-draft process. And and I'm not the only one. You know, our, our trainer has NBA experience. Our strength coach has NBA experience. Our head coach has NBA experience. And so we bring that in the lens and the evaluation lens of a young player from a projection standpoint. And so you know, if they, if they see themselves as a future pro and we see them as a future pro, and I mean that holistically, then it's probably going to be a great fit and you're going to have a great experience with us. Absolutely. And you mentioned building genuine relationships and that's, again, I'm sure you get asked this as much as I get asked this. How do you build relationships? You know, that different thing, especially for young coaches trying to rise up the ladder, so to speak. So talk to us a little bit about, because I know you have to come cultivate these relationships with executives, coaches, agents, athletes. I mean, you have everyone on your roster to try and develop these relationships, not necessarily the importance. We know they're important, but more is the practical aspect of that. Is this a daily thing for you to text, to call, to interact with people, even if you don't need something from them? all the time. Yeah. I, one of the, one of the bigger adjustments, I think in this particular role for me, I, I mean, I jokingly tell people, I don't really do anything. I just talk to people the whole day. Like at the end of the day, if you say, Hey, Anthony, what'd you do today? Like, I wouldn't be able to 
to show you something. Like I, I don't, I didn't do anything today, but I was on the phone the whole time and made some decisions and maybe gave some advice that that would result in some behavior that wouldn't have wouldn't have otherwise materialized uh, in the future. So uh, I think I think you have to, you know, I, I think reciprocity for one is like really important. It's one that I I try to to keep top of mind all the time, and I think it's hard for anybody in a leadership position to expect or demand of someone something that they're unwilling to give themselves first. I think also from a vulnerability standpoint, I've I found either as the giver and receiver of that going first is important and showing showing some vulnerability and explaining or, or giving some background, I think helps relatability. I think it diffuses tension if there is some at the beginning and also establishes the human element. But I think also one of the things that's key is that you're not going to do it right now. And, you know, I tell people all the time, like, hey, if I'm if I'm meeting someone for the first time, you know, hey, this is who I am. This is what we're about. This is, you know, why you should believe me, because this is how I've acted in the past. And this is what other people have said or whatever goes into like that initial moment. At the same time, we're not going to we're not going to be best buddies five minutes after we meet. You know, it's going to be something that's going to be an ongoing process. It's going to be a slow drip and they're going to be kind of these lightning bolt moments. I think that are, are, are moments of integrity uh, that really kind of solidify a relationship. But again, as the leader, you have to make sure that in those moments, instinctively and reactively, you are displaying behavior that is in alignment with what you've said and what you say that you value and what you've established up to that point. So I think it's that combination of of short and long term. It's it's an, a, again the empathy, the reciprocity. I think is really important, and it's and it's really not it's not a complicated dynamic. I think it's it's actually very simple to do, with, but that doesn't make it easy. It, it's it's not easy to to show up every day and think of others first. And I don't do it all the time, of course, right? Like there's sometimes that ego might get in the way. But I think if you can try to get over those moments faster than others and more genuinely than others, I think people who are watching your example sense that and are more motivated to follow that. I love it. I don't know if we've ever had it explained better on the podcast. So thanks for that. And one of the things that you shared with me that is something that you value and you thought would be valuable to coaches, which I love, is this concept of ownership of decisions. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things I learned when I was when I became the general manager of at the time the Reno Bighorns that are now the Stockton Kings, which is the G League affiliate of the Sacramento Kings. I learned that when you have a certain title, you are expected to make decisions and you have to stand by those decisions. And whether that you know, th- there are a lot of people that are longtime assistant coaches that for whatever reason, think that they have every right to criticize decisions of the head coach, which is fine until you're the one standing in the huddle with 24 sets of eyes looking on you and you have to perform in the moment and whether that be drop an ATO or, or handle conflict at a, you know, in a, in a timely fashion, or that could be an assistant GM that criticizes a draft choice of a GM or, or a director of scouting that might be based remotely that doesn't, have a full grasp of the understanding of the the priorities or pressures of the ownership group, right? When making a decision. So I think one of the, one of the most valuable things when I look back at being a GM at a young age, especially was when you step in front of whether that be the players or the staff, the decisions in that environment are produced by, by hopefully like collectivism and information sharing, of course, but they're ultimately my decision and I have to represent that. And the first year, not to get too far down this tangent, but my first year as, as GM of the Bighorns was the first year that two-way contracts were introduced to the NBA. And so the, the goal obviously was to have was to have deep alignment between your G League affiliate and your NBA team. So we had just come off of bringing five NBA rookies onto the Kings roster. One of them uh, was De'Aaron Fox with the fifth pick. And then another all the way down the other end of the spectrum was a a uh, draft rights player that we had traded for previously that was now going to sign into the NBA. His name is Bogdan Bogdanovich. 
um, as of this morning um, was with um, Atlanta, I believe. I don't know what happened with the trade deadline, but so we had we had four rookies, excuse me, five rookies coming in, four from the draft, one from free agency. And so the first year introduction of the two-way contracts, the strategy was, hey, let's go get some two-way guys that are more established, have, have MBA skills that are clear that then as we're creating development plans for our rookies that would involve assignment to the G League, we can swap them out so our head coach would have some players on the roster that he can count on in various ways. So we signed uh, Jack Cooley and Jakar Sampson to two-way contracts, and they were they were great for us, and we would move players back and forth. And we were early in our commitment to them because we had come out of the draft, we had established strategy, we acted on it quickly, which I think one of one, – one of my good friends who worked in a long time for a premier league soccer club, one of the best, one of the best clubs ever internationally, he said, speed to decision. He was big on speed to decision. And he said, if I can come to, if I can come to a conclusion faster than you can, I'm going to win. If the, if that conclusion is, you know, a correct one and a valuable one. So we acted early, we spent money. We were one of the first NBA teams to give money to a returning rights player. So in the G league, if, a player ends the season on your roster, you have basically the right to re-sign that player for two years if that player wants to sign into the G League. You have, you know, that's just, you have their rights. They can't play for another G League team unless you you trade them. So by contract, you really don't have to give them any money to come back because if they want to play in the G League, you sign them and that's just the way it is. Well, we gave money to returning rights players. And so I say that to say we, we invested a lot and we invested early in a group of players for our G League team. And we started the season five and 10, which was very disappointing. And again, this is not the, this is not an Ignite lens. This is a, okay, we're in the G League and we're developing, but you're also a professional team and you have expectations. And so we started the season five and 10 and I, and I will never forget. We, we were in Ontario, California. We're playing the Clippers G League affiliate. And that was our 10th loss. And I, I remember standing in the locker room near the door, just looking at the roster. And I said to myself, I like this group. And regardless of our record, I, I like the personalities. I like the personality mix. The skill set was there. They're complementary to each other. They're here for a reason. Our processes are sound. I like this group. And we did nothing in response to, and, and I don't know how many, you know, straight losses it was to get to five and 10, but we did nothing. And we ran off 13 of our next 14 games and we finished with the second best record in the conference. And we had three players called up and a couple players play for USA basketball. And it was an incredibly successful season due, due to our players and that mix of the assignment guys and the two ways and the G league guys. And so I, in that moment knew that, whether that would be the, the human capital, the finance capital, whatever, right? Those decisions were mine. And I had to be comfortable with the product that was being shown on the court, the product that shows up in the community, the, the, the discussions behind the scenes, our, our program behavior as a whole. I had to own those decisions. And that was one of the biggest growth moments, I think, was that, that awareness that I had where I said, okay, well, I have this title and with the title comes an opportunity to be inspirational to others, to offer opportunity to others, to put people in positions to excel. And then I have to own that. And whether it, whether it, well, I will say if it works, it's because of the player and because of the environment. If it doesn't work, it's, that was, that was my call. And we're going to evaluate and we're going to see if it was a process related issue or environmental related issue, which brings in, you know, you know, fundamental attribution error type of lessons. Right. But but that that concept of, OK, if you if you have a leadership position and you have a leadership title, there are responsibilities and opportunities that come with that. And it's disappointing to me when people don't stand by that and they don't own that. Well, I love the example. I love the phrasing, ownership of decisions. I love speed of decisions. That's such a cool kind of part to it. The part I want to dive into a little bit more is the connection between ownerships, 
ownership of decisions and integrity. Because that's really what you're talking about here is that like the integrity that you hold for this decision shines through whatever happens. And I think the other impressive part about that story is that it's really hard to kind of see the future as we know, but to be able to stick with it, knowing that you own the decision that you did at the beginning and to not have to panic at that point and kind of say, oh, we got to change everything because we're not winning yet. There's a yet to that conversation all the time. So talk to us a little bit more about integrity and the connection of that. And then maybe that yet part. During the during the NBA hiatus, I got into the West Wing. I didn't watch the West Wing like when it came out, but I got into the West Wing. And the character Toby had a great quote during the season of the the re-election, I, I think is what it was. And he said, we can't govern if we don't win. And you know, to your point, there's there's definitely truth to that, where if we don't win, we don't give ourselves an opportunity to be in position to then do some of these other things, right? And get to the medium, <laughs> excuse me, in, in long term. So I completely agree. Like there's there's definitely an aspect of, of the yet, and you have to perform at some point collectively. But yeah, I... I I, t- I had a conversation with one of our players recently and I told him, you know, it's easy to stand by someone when things are going well. But again, going back to relationship building, it's, it's the moments when it might be unpopular or uncomfortable or inconvenient that you really need to, it, you as the leader, me as the leader asks whether it be consciously or, or <laughs> even unconsciously, am I really about this? Like, do I really believe this? And that could be, do I really believe in this player? Or do I really believe in this behavior? It's easy to do that when the sun's shining and you're winning and everyone's getting along and all of that. But it's in the moments that are the opposite of those where you really find out what you're about and find out if you're really willing to do that. And again, in a genuine way, and then others will see that. And then I think that that can get you through and carry you through and sustain and get you to higher and higher plateaus. I think, you know, you start at a certain level and you, you, you know, you might plateau and you have these moments where, I mean, and I've seen it with teams before where you just start playing better and it's, well, why are you guys playing better? And it's like, well, I don't know. I can't, I can't name a moment that happened, right? Oh, the lights got brighter in the gym today. And so we, we, we ended up better, but it's, it's that like those little moments where you keep grinding away and then and then you look back on a rolling two weeks or one month or something and you say, oh, well, we're, gosh, we're a lot better now than we were, you know, in November. And, and that's that's what happens with our Ignite guys, where it's like, well, what what moment did, you know, Leonard Miller figure it out last year? Like I, I couldn't point to a moment, but it was this slow, steady process that then allowed him to, to get to the point where he could get some consistent production. So I, I think that that carries uh, through through many aspects of leadership and decision making. Well, and it speaks to my wheelhouses, which is obviously skill acquisition, motor learning, and this concept of nonlinear development, which I know you embrace completely. So let me get your thoughts on any type of insights in ways to be able to accelerate on court development, uh, because again, this G League Unite is sort of this social science experiment in terms of accelerating development for players and particularly embracing this concept of it being nonlinear. Yeah. You could, you could say whether that be like silver linings, micro silver linings, right. To find those. I think it also depends on, I think in order to do that, you have to really redefine what success looks like again, and what our purpose is and what are our, what are our success metrics and and then if you if you do that, it's it's definitely nonlinear, but it becomes much more linear when you redefine what you're what you're looking for again and what success looks like. So the nonlinear part of it might come in the form of wins, or for us, it's you know, a player rising on draft boards and not not media draft boards. I mean like actual NBA decision making draft boards. Um, we had Marjan Bochamp, for example. Marjan was unknown to many NBA decision makers the uh, September before our season started two years ago and went from that to being a first round pick. So that looks very nonlinear when in fact, when you go back and look at how, how he structured his goal setting and then how we structure the program, it probably looks a little more steadily, steadily increasing than that. However, yes, you have these moments where, 
every day, every moment, every substitution pattern is not going to be better than the last one. But if your approach is consistent and your your definition of success is consistent, you will eventually get there and you'll get there in in spikes, in moments of 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 spikiness. I guess for me then, I guess the other part that goes with this in terms of development is connecting this for them, not just as a basketball player, but for them for life success, which is, I know you do stuff around financial literacy. You do stuff about life skills. You do stuff around that. And uh, I'm not saying you can do it better than college or another professional atmosphere, but the unique part about that is, as you've said already, you have this mentorship model in place of players that have been through that and have done that. So maybe share a little bit more about how that fits into the overall picture of development, because clearly comfort and confidence off the court helps comfort and confidence on the court. Yeah. Again, going back to, and I'm, I'm by no means trying to position myself as an expert on these things, but like I, I just read an article today about the research paper on people who were denied promotions and the effect on identity on, on their approach to their job. And effectively, a, a denied promotion could be in the form of a player getting cut, player getting traded. You know, there's some guys for the Knicks today. Now they play for the Pistons. And so, you know, you can interpret that as, as a denied promotion. You could interpret not being drafted where you want to be as a denied promotion, et cetera. And so, it, 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 the, you know, the research um, that I was reading today was on how people interpret that. General responses are negative, right? What are those negative responses? And then in that moment, in that, in that crisis moment, right? How do we turn it into a growth opportunity and build resilience or, or uh, lean on resilience that you've already built to get through that moment? And so I, I say that to say with Ignite, we, th these players are put in a position that is by far the most difficult basketball environment that they've ever been in. And they want that and they ask for that. And this is what it is. And this is no surprise, but there's also only so much we can verbalize uh, to get that picture across absent them actually feeling it, right? Absent, absent our young guys going against, you know, yesterday we, we played the Clippers and they have four NBA players on the court, right? You can't really simulate that in a meeting in June. You really kind of have to feel that. So we, they, they want that. It's part of what makes an Ignite player an Ignite player. I believe that it's a huge, there's a huge correlation between that mindset and attitude and the success that they will have that our alums have had in the NBA. But it's, it's an identity shock, really, because these guys in many ways have been conditioned to identify as basketball players and identify as successful basketball players which rightfully so they have done the things to establish that reputation and establish that identity. One of the most important things we do is to try to put resources and education around them to, I don't know, maybe compartmentalize is not the right word, but, but to position that as just one of a part of your identity as a person. I am an athlete, but I'm also a hard worker. I love challenges. I am curious so, so that when you get into games and you don't perform well from a box score standpoint, which is going to happen just because of the talent of the G League, we, we've played against 60-some NBA. I mean, the G League is just so talented. And so it's a, it's a credit to the league and the NBA and its positioning of the G League within its ecosystem. But necessarily so, when you go and you don't perform well from a box score standpoint, it's not a complete shock to my confidence in a consistent way. <laughs> so, yeah, I, identity... And, and, and kind of the self is a big part of our holistic development approach for these guys. Well, and I was going to ask a little bit deeper about that, which is this concept of, you said principles of psychology before, but coping strategies with struggles. Because in two really brief conversations with some of your players, younger players, they both mentioned the value of their struggles. And I, I, I feel that that's positive framing from your organization's perspective, that they look at it that way, because inevitably they come from a situation where they're highly successful, McDonald's All-American or top ranked player, highly successful to, as you mentioned, real struggles playing against players that are veterans, more experienced, and in some ways just better capable of managing the situation. So 
talk to us a little bit more about these coping strategies, because I feel that's one of the most important things we can do as coaches as well, is to provide players these strategies. Yeah, I think provide the strategies and then also um, provide support through them uh, is important, right? And again, it, it goes back to when it's difficult, I need to be there for you. Like, that's why I'm here. And that doesn't mean babying them. That's another conversation we have. Like, that doesn't mean just doing everything for you. Um, we're big on empowerment and we're big on uh, putting guys in positions where they have tools and resources and then they have to figure it out. They have to figure out how to use them and 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 why certain people or things are in their life and what the purpose is. That could be that could be a nutritionist or it could be a foam roll, right? Like, why is this here and how do I use it? But yeah, I, it, the game and the environment of our competition in and of itself is that is it's that it's that getting to and probably even at the early stages way past these guys challenge points. And, uh, and that's okay. Because again, we know we're going to play 50 games. We're going to be together for a number of months, which really isn't that long <laughs> of, a, of a time from a development standpoint, but, but it is again, how we define success. It's that's the long term, right? The long term is nine months for most of these guys ish, nine ish months. And so, yeah, we, we have to, we have to put them in positions where they're stretched beyond their, their, uh, their capabilities, but then we also have to support them and educate them and walk alongside them, develop those, like you said, those coping strategies to, to, to enhance that resilience. And I think ultimately that, that brings about greater learning and, and you also have the emotional connection, I think to it, where, where again, you know, that, that identity crisis and that, well, wait a minute, I'm a, I've won three state championships. I haven't lost, I haven't lost 15 games in the last five years of my life. Like this doesn't happen. But again, if you look at, you know, I, we're not going into games trying to lose, of course. But again, this is just like a factor of how talented the league is. But if we have a player who wants to be a top five pick, you're going to a team that's losing 60 to, you know, 65 to you know, 55 games, something like that, right? Your win percentage is not good. And so just inherently in being here, you learn how to stay the course and, you know, amidst performance difficulties, amidst, I should say, absent results necessarily that you're used to. How do I continue to steady my approach and grow and use these moments and interpret these moments as growth opportunities positive growth opportunities, as opposed to maybe how I was conditioned before where I lose a game and therefore I'm less of a person because uh, that's not a healthy mindset, of course. Really, I mean, your, your work in this area as an organization, Sean, through in my conversations with those two players. So I appreciate you sharing more depth of that. Another thing that I'm always fascinated with, and we talked about it briefly when we were together, but kind of the challenge for coaches is the balance is qualitative and quantitative data in your decision-making process. And I know you've been at the forefront of this for a very long time in terms of uh, the NBA and the access to data. So maybe share some insights on uh, for us as coaches and for us as people kind of in balancing those two things. Yeah, you know, like I mentioned with the Spurs, I've, I've been very lucky to have been around some of the greatest minds in, in sports analytics, basketball analytics for sure. And so, uh, again, I, I, I'm by no means a statistician or a data scientist, but um, I've been around a lot of people that have shed some light and, and shared um, their knowledge with me. It's it's harder for us to be quantitative again, because you just you, you don't have the sample size that the NBA has. I mean, even, you know, if you're if you're analyzing a five man lineup combination, for example, like it just takes a, a large amount of minutes um, to get to the point where you have a legitimate sample size. So we don't have that. We don't have that luxury, unfortunately, but you, but uh, you know, I, I think that doesn't mean you can't be processed and you can't be diligent in your subject, in your subjective assessments. And I think what we try to do probably most consistently from a quantitative standpoint is show the MBA example, even though we can't really connect it to what they're going through right now because they're not playing an 82 game season they're not playing four straight seven game playoff series but we can show examples of that and we can show you know hey if you think it's hard to play 24 minutes you know put a 24 minute stint of a G League game together imagine what it's like you know playing 37 in a game six of the playoffs right and we can we can 
put those numbers around to try to give some some points of comparison and to add relevance to what we're trying to teach. So so we do do that quite a bit, even though we can't. It's hard for us again, just sample size and availability of data to do that nearly at the level that the MBA would from a monitoring and, and a kind of a milestoning standpoint. Well, and I can value that answer because I think it's a relatable answer for, say, a high school coach or even a college coach that doesn't have their roster together as long in terms of kind of going with kind of some of the norms over time within the league or within the, you know, the whole obviously basketball landscape that they face. So I think I I, I think I value that actually quite a bit. And then the other part that kind of I wanted to get to is like. No question, having an administrator, an athletic director, a general manager, I mean, there are both challenges and uh, positives to that for a coach sometimes in terms of that relationship and kind of things that go back and forth. So maybe particularly, let's start from a conflict resolution perspective. What are some some things from a conflict resolution perspective you can highlight for us in terms of dealing with that coach uh, administrator relationship? Great question. Yeah, I... I, I saw a lot of that. We all in, have <laughs> time. Yeah. And, and was fortunate to see a lot of that actually, because it, it provided some, some valuable life lessons and, and, and observation. I think first of all, again, the relationship building of it, the empathy, I always found it hypocritical for anyone evaluating coaches to not watch practice. You don't have to be there every day, right? I'm not at practice every single day, for example, because there are other parts of a uh, general manager's job description or an owner or an AD's job description that's outside of the, you know, two and a half hours of practice. But I always found it hypocritical to not want to be there, to not make effort to be there, to not make effort to know what our defensive calls are and what our general defensive philosophy is. I, I just, I don't think you can, I don't think you can properly evaluate and collaborate with someone if you don't understand what is trying to be accomplished. I mean, I've been in rooms where players get criticized for doing something on the court. And it's like, that's not what the coach was asking him to do anyway. Right. Like they just, they broke the play and they made a terrible play. And it's like, well, why is the coach putting them in that position? And it's like, no, that's that. They actually just went and did totally their own thing. If you would actually know our playbook, you would know that. So, so I, I, I feel, I feel fortunate to, have built relationships with our NBA coaching staffs and with our night coaching staff. Like I'll sit in on their coaches meetings. I'm with them in halftime. I'm in the locker room. I'm in the personnel film study because I think it's important to know what's going on. And if you don't know what's going on, how are you, how are you positioned to support those stakeholders? How are you positioned to support a player or a coach? And so, you know, when a player comes and says, Hey, you know, I should play more minutes. It becomes, well, you know, I was there, you know, I was in, I was, I was on the baseline watching the game. I was in the film room. Like I, I, you know, and, and you can just better, I think um, you're better armed with, with data to be able to help and to be able to, to get, get the situation back on track. It also goes, I think from a, you know, a lot of people will look and they'll say, well, you know, a GM and head coach, it's like one or the other. It could also, I mean, you have all these tensions in an organization, right? Your head of community relations is going to want players to make appearances all over the place. And your head of health and performance is going to want them to go home and sleep in a, you know, soundproof room. So, it, you know, they're like, you're going to have these tensions. So I think it's just, again, a matter of like, okay, do I understand what the other person's job is? Do I understand where they're coming from? Have I built that relationship? And then can we come together? And if it's, you know, ignite, it's, can we come together and, form and be a united front for what's the best interest of the player. And then if you're, you know, college or high school, whatever, and you need to win, it's okay. Can we do what is needed to protect the brand and win games and, you know, represent the the university or the program well, but yeah, it's, it, if, if managed poorly, it, it can be absolute disaster we see. And, and, and then unfortunately it affects the people who are trying to go about things the right way. You know, you, you have volatility in your coach or management staff or your training staff or performance staff. The victims of it are the players and the victims of it are the young people who, who don't are, aren't afforded the opportunity to continue to develop and grow and build that cohesion. So if so, I'm a coach, I have, you know, a concern. What is one of the best ways to me, to me, for me to be able to voice that concern to you as an administrator, general manager, and athletic director? That's a good question. I, I mean, I think you come at it with with an, a genuine 
goal of of helping wh whatever your whatever your goal is. Let's say it's a it's a general like non non ignite situation. We know what we're trying to accomplish together, right? We're trying to win a conference championship. We're trying to make sectionals. We're trying to make the playoffs, whatever it is, right? Okay, we've established that. Every suggestion, every idea, every approach, if it is done from an external focus and a team focus, I can't imagine someone who is also team focused and external focus, right, receiving that well. And there are many examples of task conflict resulting in higher performing teams and um, having dialogue back and forth. And I think, again, it's it's a conversation of like, what can I do for the group? I think a lot of times, not not just coaches, people, whether that be, you know, I've seen I've seen people who make personnel decisions who feel like like offended that a player isn't playing well and then they blame the coach because now this is this hit on my reputation as an evaluator. It's like, no, that's not the case. Like there are all kinds of, of factors and variables that go into team performance. The coach is one, the players are one, health is one, the environment is one, the external stakeholders are another, your competition is another. So I think if we can establish all of these things and hey, we're trying to do, we're trying to make decisions with all of the information that we have available at the time, we're trying to optimize decision in the moment. We don't know if it's actually going to be the, the optimal decision, but given, given all the information we have in the moment, we're trying to do the best that we can. That I think that mindset, I think going into any kind of task conflict is a winner. I love it. And I mean, we've all faced this before. I used to get texts from players. We need to talk. You know, it's like the girlfriend texts you and says, we need to talk. It's generally not a good thing, right? So like in advance of a communication like this, do you value kind of having an idea? Like, is it a preference to kind of be able to shape a conversation before it happens in a sense that say, hey, Anthony, I would like to talk to you about this. And then does that help diffuse a little bit of the kind of the I got you type of mentality of that conversation? Yeah, I think it depends that it, yes, if you're assuming that the person actually knows what they want to talk about mm -hmm. and sometimes that sometimes they don't, uh, sometimes they think an issue is the issue and it's actually not the issue. So it depends. They taught me in business school that the answer to every question is it depends, by the way. So I guess I should just answer. answer I remember that. that from our conversation. Yeah. So I, I embrace those conversations. I think they're learning opportunities. I had one the other day with a player that started as a minutes discussion and went all the way into food and culture. And, you know, an hour and a half later, we're talking about a bunch of stuff that is, again, tied to belonging and, and identity and goal setting and, you know, those, and those are the real issues, right? Like the, the minutes and the shots and the, all that, that's just a, that's a byproduct of all of the other stuff. In most cases, right? Like, you know, if you're going into a discussion on like, you know, injury return to play protocols and stuff like that's more, that's going to be more straightforward, more black and white, probably. So I think I, I, I love those conversations. Again, it's a huge part of my job, whether it be having one with a coach or player or uh, an agent or a scout for an NBA team that is that's going through some kind of uncertainty. But that's where the questioning comes in. And that's where the listening comes in. And, you know, one, one of the things I remember from watching Coach Pop in San Antonio was the embrace of silence and to allow someone to answer the question and give them time for thought and, and, and asking follow-up questions and clarification questions, right? Do you, well, why do you think that? Do you really, do you really think this, you know, and then putting it back on them? And then I, I think if you do it successfully, which which I, I hopefully have grown better at from a practice standpoint, but then you get the person to answer their own questions and you get them to say it themselves so that it's not one way, it's it's coming from them and then they feel ownership of it. And then there's been this illuminating moment where, well, wait a minute, I, you know, and it's the, the, the ism of, you know, you, you don't gain knowledge, you just discover what you already had inside kind of thing, right? It's just those moments. And if you can get them again, from an empowerment standpoint, whomever it is, if it's a young player, if it's, you know, someone even older that's, that's going through something, if you can get them to come up with their own solutions, so much more powerful than just giving someone a blueprint and telling them what to do. There's a place for that, right? There's a place for that. It's called, you know, down one, 
five seconds left coming out of the timeout, like be here, like don't try something new in that situation. But most moments are not that obviously. I love that example from pop. I mean, I, I talked about, I tried to always normalize that with players because I use questioning cold calling as part of my coaching strategy, but to get them to understand that it's okay to be silent for a little bit and not have to answer it right away, because I'm not going to jump down your throat if you don't answer it right away either and creating that kind of psychological safety. So that's such an, a great example. Another thing that I, I we kind of talked about briefly when we were there, but this concept of kind of risk-taking trial and error, you know, within the margins of safety and obviously the development goals that you have for your players, because uh, obviously we don't want to screw up their future possibilities, but you are one of maybe the only professional organizations that potentially can approach things from more of a risk, risk-taking perspective because the focus is not purely on winning. So can you talk to us about that perspective a little bit and then maybe how you see the program evolving in the coming years? Yeah, I. if you have an answer to this, I'd be very curious about, like I read an article the other day about business strategy, right? And like core competencies and the, the percentage of exploitation of a competitive advantage versus exploration of a new potential competitive advantage and what that, what that appropriate ratio is and, you know, in the moment, and it probably changes over the course of a, a business's life cycle as well as an NBA team's life cycle. So I, I think it's it's that trying to find that because players come in with strengths and with with transferable skill that we that we want to draw on every game and get them to to you know display those every game that serves a number of purposes that are positive. But then also we need to get them again out of their comfort zone and put them in situations where they're challenged and they can grow. And so you know one that comes to mind for example is like playing players out of their out of their natural position, uh, natural meaning like what they're used to and playing them in a position that is going to probably be what their NBA position is. Position meaning like, you know, not not even necessarily like the label, but just the actions that they're in and type of defensive coverage that they'll put them in, et cetera. So if you have someone who is a good athlete, who's a versatile athlete that projects as someone that's going to, to be able to guard multiple NBA positions, uh, let's use Dyson Daniels as an example, who was the the uh, a lottery pick a couple years ago. Um, he might guard point guards, he might guard wings, he might guard threes, he could switch on the fours. And so well, what does that mean? Well, that means I have to, you know, guard pick and roll differently. I might be guarding the ball handler in pick and roll. Well, then the next possession, if I'm going to switch and then, you know, the team is going to go through a number of actions. Well, now in the same possession, I might have guarded the ball handler in pick and roll and I have to guard the screener and pick and roll. And so I have to hear coverage at, at 19 seconds on the shot clock. And now I have to say coverage at seven seconds on the shot clock or something. Well, you know, for a, for an 18 year old <laughs> coming in and playing against NBA players in the G league, that's really hard. And so, but we, but we necessarily have to put them in position where they're stretched beyond their means to then over the course of the season. And they get put more in those situations that the game slows down and they're able to get through those moments at a quicker pace and be able to um, develop that muscle memory and, and those reaction skills to be able to do it as opposed to maybe they're thinking about it in November, which is, which is a good sign. Like, again, that it, it goes back to how you, how you define your success where you might say, well, you know, someone was late on that coverage, right. And he, and he missed it, but it's like, yeah, but he, but he said it. Right. And so like, there's some, there's some skill building there that we can build off of. So to be able to, to identify that. So again, like we want to get them to, to what they're good at. And there's a reason that they're here and they displayed skill sets. And now we also have to build up on that. Anthony, I cannot thank you enough. I mean, this, you know, this did feel like we were just sitting around the table, having some food and having a conversation and certainly one that uh, I was able to get your insights on so many different things. So thank you so much for sharing the game with us. Yeah. Thank you for wanting to know what I have to think and say, and we'll look forward to staying in touch. I always enjoy our conversation. So thank you.